The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk today about butene E and the beastine E. That's right, it's beastly. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And we're here to talk about today, as many of you probably know, because I'm assuming this is the kind of uh, a large portion of our in inductee uh, audience, uh, this kind of came about because I used to run the riffing group Ice on Mars. These are still Ice on Mars productions. Life just got in the way of being able to do actual full riffs because of the amount of writing and timing and editing and blah, 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 blah. And so I switched over to this format because I thought it would be just as entertaining in a lot of ways, but take a lot less time. Beastly is actually one where we have the first 15 minutes written somewhere, and so that might still be a thing one day. But I think we can look at it in a lot of different ways and talk about it in ways that will be fun and not at all boring and uh, overlapping here. What do you think, Marisha? Yeah, I think I think so. In any case... Plot synopsis. Do you want to take that away, Marisha? Okay, plot synopsis. There's this kid who's pretty much a douchebag in high school. He's so much a douchebag that this other high school student uh, curses him to be ugly. He's ugly for a while. He meets a cute girl. They fall in love. And at the end, he's miraculously transformed back into not ugly again. Oh, spoiler alert, Marisha. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, right? I mean, it's 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 beauty. From what I've heard, this is Beauty and the Beast, but done with teenagers. Which means that they had to take the story and like twist it every which way to really try to make it resemble Beauty and the Beast, and they they really tried hard. I don't think they succeeded very well. The thing that amused me the most was the fact that, you know, I haven't seen Beauty and the Beast. And I mean, I'm sure I've read like a book about, you know, like a kid's book of Beauty and the Beast when I was really young or whatever. But I've never seen like the Disney movie, which I guess is the, you know, the quintessential go to version of it. Right. And right. Um, but as far as I know, like uh, Bell is for whatever reason forced to stay in his castle and the way that they manhandled that, I was oh, like, holy shit. Like, really, they really, really awful. <laughs> he becomes Batman for one scene. <laughs> just just for one scene, just for a little bit. And the and the writing of it is just it's just it's just really bad. It's the most contrived thing I've ever seen in a movie. Like the the way they get her to stay with him. Yeah, essentially her father shoots a guy who's shaking him down for drug money. <laughs> and this is in a film that has up to this point been kind of a goofy teenage movie with a curse that we'll talk about in a minute, but with a curse that's, I mean, it's not like a life or death sort of curse. And, you know, it's all about like feelings and learning to find what love is. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's like, where's the money pops? Yo, and bang, bang, bang. And I killed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's and it gets really dark all of a sudden. The only points in the movie that it is ever dark like that is with her father. Like he, at first, he kills this guy out of nowhere, and we also have no idea what happened with that, like how they hid the body or anything. And then at the end, he he ODs, and then that's like this big thing. So those are the only two parts of the movie that are any sort of I don't know serious, I guess, in any way. I really wanted more of the father story. I wanted more of like you killed a dude. <laughs> I wanted some follow-up to this, and instead it's just... Uh, wh what's our lead guy's name? I keep thinking of him as Hunter. That's the fake name that he Yeah, takes his on. name uh, originally is Kyle, and then he goes by Hunter to right. to, to the girl, uh, Lindy, because he doesn't want her to know that, it, that he's this high school student that she's met before. Right, even though he's the same height, the same age, and he has this very distinctive accent. Yeah, he does. What accent is that anyway? Uh, European? It sounded vaguely like some some mix of American and European, but I, I couldn't quite place it. <laughs> oh, but it was the girl who wanted to go to Europe. She she just wanted to go to Machu Picchu, right? Is that oh, in yeah. Europe? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I thought that was that like is, an actually. island somewhere. God, I don't know. That's another thing. There's this big kind of plot point or emotional point about her wanting to go to Machu Picchu, and it's like, oh, you know, if 
if she doesn't make it by this certain time, then um, then she's not going to get to be able to see Machu Picchu. And it's like, he could just fly them there, you know? Like, he could just buy his own goddamn jet yeah. and take him there. Yeah. The lead guy, Hunter Kyle, is Alex Pettifer, who I, I don't know from anything else. The lead girl is Vanessa Hudgens, who I think she was on a Disney show or something. Is that right? I guess so. She was really cute. I Like, she was pleasant to look at throughout the movie. And in, there were so many difficult parts to this movie just because the writing was so bad that she was just kind of a breath of fresh air, I thought. Really? I yeah. kept wondering, is she learning disabled? Because I thought her acting was so horrible. I thought it like... <laughs> okay, point... everyone's acting was horrible, though. Like, it was <laughs> all really bad. Even Neil Patrick Harris was not great yeah that, and i that, rarely like him that was the other thing i was gonna say is that neil patrick harris is of course in this as his blind tutor yeah and he doesn't pull off being blind very well a, a few times but boy does he remind you of it yes yes very, every single scene <laughs> every single sentence of his starts out with oh blindy shock she again or something like that and it's like you know i I I get if I were blind, I would it would be like a big deal, but I don't think every single sentence would have to pertain to my being blind. Yeah, I don't think so. Like if somebody offers me a piece of food and I say no, I'm not like shocks you that old fatty said no to food, huh? You know, it's like it doesn't. It was as if the screenwriter or screenwriters were really afraid that people would forget that he was blind. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the other big thing is that the witch is Mary-Kate Olsen, the, the uh, witch who curses him. Mary-Kate Olsen playing a kind of <laughs> zombie raccoon Darth Vader. And her hair changes every single time we see her. <laughs> changes color, changes style. Like, I have no idea what her hair was doing. Yeah, and the hats that she wore. There, there was this great scene where kyle leaves the house on his motorcycle and the vines play and i was like fuck yeah and it was like i wanna get free i was like i'm totally with this movie now and then the vines just go away after did you notice how music in this movie was kind of like seasoning it on was... a really big spread yeah i i know i liked the music that they used but then they'd they'd use just just a couple bars of it like they would just use a little snippet and then they'd take it away that that happened quite a few times right it was it was just seasoning it was just it was like in case you forgot how you're supposed to be feeling in the scene here's a quick little you know like this is energy okay okay no more music yeah my, <laughs> my favorite music was at the end where she reads his letter and it says i might be falling in love with you and then the music kicks in and it's like i'm falling in love with you <laughs> Like, just, just so that case. they can remind the audience that there right. is love just, going on. Just in case. Mary-Kate's hair was pretty impressive. And her hat, uh, at one point she's trying to pull off this, like, voodoo priest sort of look. Mm -hmm. The scene that I was talking about, which that was kind of strange. Like, like I was like, oh, did Hunter go to Mardi Gras? But then it was apparently a school function because the only people he saw there were people from his school. Oh, I also thought it was a Mardi Gras thing, though. And I thought it was just contrived coincidence that they all happened to run into each other and talk about well, each other for no reason. <laughs> because they had to have some exposition about what was going on in the characters' minds. And they couldn't figure out any other way to do that except for having the, the main actress tell this random stranger everything that's in her heart about this random stranger just that she doesn't even know <laughs> yeah there was just exposition left and right thrown out in this movie and 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 that scene she says something like you know what that is it's a shot of life which yeah. i i don't know what that means and i was like did i hear that wrong but i didn't care enough to rewind it and she was talking about him being a douchebag too so i don't really know oh that's right right yeah i admired that he said things like it is it was a shot of life and it's like what what does that mean does that and speaking of the music, did you notice that the opening credits had three songs worth? It was three songs worth of opening credits. I don't oh, think... I didn't notice that, no. I do not think I have ever seen a movie with that many opening credit songs. Who says WTF? I just, I gotta ask that. <laughs> like the actual letters? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because his girlfriend does. And I was like, no, that just doesn't, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> so one of the two things that I want to talk about, uh, a big thing is, so, you know, essentially he's cursed uh, for 
he has one year and he has this tattoo on his arm that is is a tree and it changes with the seasons and he's got until the spring blossoms bloom again uh, one year to get somebody to say i love you to him probably and mean it too or whatever or else he's going to stay like this forever of course the big big problem with the movie beyond the fact that it is i i don't i i i kind of wonder was there a really good two-hour script out there somewhere and then they were like no fuck it cut that cut that cut that cut that i don't know i th- i thought it went on longer than it needed to to be anyway i d- i don't feel that the writing in any of this was good and i actually i've written down some like some of the choice quotes that are just awful yeah it was just 86 minutes long though it just it moves so fast i at least thank it for that you know what i i got so <laughs> caught up in talking about the ridiculousness of this that I totally forgot to do what the fuck moments. Go ahead. I think I've probably just yelled mine out at this point. Okay, so the the main one that I had was was Kyle's just awful high school election speech. He gets elected to high school president literally from a speech that tells the entire audience, you're ugly and I don't care about anything I'm getting elected for, but elect me anyway. And then then he gets elected. The, The line in there that really stood out to me is best embrace the suck yeah and did you notice that that was tattooed on his eyebrows no i couldn't tell what his eyebrows were tattooed like i I couldn't see what that was yeah yeah it's slightly um stylized but yeah one eyebrow says embrace and the other says suck and there's a little scribble underneath his nose staples that i assume is meant to be the okay so that's yeah that's one it starts out with that that giant speech and the entire high school I was like, is this set in the future or did I go to a really bad school? Because they have like these Those holographic displays of the <laughs> letters and stuff. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Of like the schedules and shit. And, and then his face is gigantic everywhere. I mean, they say it's a private school, but still. Uh, so yeah. anyway. And, uh, okay, so your next what the fuck moment? Evil curse tattoo that lights up cheerfully for Christmas. It was very festive. Yes. And then it winks at him at the end. When he passes, yes, which, which was also creepy. It was. So one of my two main issues here is she curses him to be ugly. And essentially he looks like kind of a hardcore metal or raver dude. Like he doesn't really look bad per se. He just Yeah, I looks... agree. The only thing that like really is off-putting is the scars, but other than that, like he actually looks pretty cool. Yeah, the scars are a little intense and it's a little weird that they never heal or whatever. That's a little strange, but overall, he's not really, you know, like um, a seven-year-old would probably be freaked out by him, but you know, there are people who do worse things to their bodies on purpose. That's true. And my thought was, considering how easy everything is for him in this movie to manipulate as far as gifts, having her live with him, blah, 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 blah. Can you imagine what sort of a different movie this would be if Mary-Kate Olsen had cursed him to be poor? Oh, yeah, that might have been a more interesting movie. It would have been a much shorter movie, because I think he would have committed suicide about 25 (laughs) minutes in. Very possibly. But, but that was that was what I kept wondering. I was like, this just isn't very strong of a curse. And by the end of it, you can tell he's realizing, like, I, I can do this, you know? I still got a fucking motorcycle. <laughs> Part of what was rough to watch the movie was that throughout most of the thing, he's got the personality of a grapefruit. Like, he's just, like, in the very beginning, he's just a douchebag. After he gets ugly, it's just... There's very little there that makes him, that gives him anything of substance, except for the side characters telling him that he's got a good personality. That's something I really wondered about. His nanny, I guess would be the word for it, is his his nanny. Housekeeper, I think. Yeah, his housekeeper, Zola, who, like, his dad puts him in the city so that, like, he doesn't have to live with him or be seen with him. And then Zola just, like, comes along, and it's like, hey, Zola, you've got a four-hour commute now. That's cool, right? And she's, <laughs> I guess she's just okay with it. She says at one point, you know, you can be the man I know you to be. And I'm like, how? How would you know that he has this potential to be a great man? You've never seen him be anything but a douche or confused. But he did ask about her kids once. So he's got he's got multiple layers. 
I, I think that was my big problem is that not necessarily I didn't I didn't think he had a personality of a grapefruit. I just thought he had the personality of like someone trying to get something over on somebody. Because for instance, pre curse, he does some nice things and says some nice things, and it really feels like because of the lack of a caring father figure or caring parent of any sort in his life, he's just got this need to be loved, you know? And Well and... see, I don't know. From the at the very beginning, like the the first impression I got was that he was like American psycho in training. Cause we the first we see of him is him working out or whatever. And then he does that horrible speech where he just admits to everybody that he's he's a douchebag, elect me anyway. And then he does this thing with the witch where he's like you know how in high school people will like a guy might be nice to a girl in pr- in private and then and then diss her in public. Yeah, and then he does that and like takes it to an to a really extreme level. Like he like clears the entire floor to just to just chew this girl out for being for for not winning the election and really is what he's really getting after her for. It's funny that you make the American Psycho reference because that is one of our riffs at the beginning of the movie is Jim Henson's American Psycho Babies. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I thought was really weird about that bit was the fact, not not the working out, but the him trying to shame Mary-Kate Olsen, was the fact that he was earlier nice to Lindy, and it just seemed like he had kind of a nice side. And so it was like, well, why was he just such a douche to uh, Mary-Kate like, with Lindy, it was okay to show his slightly more human side because she was cute? I mean, is that... Well, it, it, he's a, like, firm believer in the very beginning. He and his father both, which is really just bad writing because who actually thinks this way? But they both talk to each other like, looks are the only thing that matters. So the way he treats Lindy really proves that point. Like, he, she's cute, and so he, he likes her. Like, that's... So, I mean, that's... Got it. So she she rates as human. Yes. To to push that thought home, he has what I thought were some kind of contradictory facts on his, like, faux book page. It's like faux Facebook. I, I don't know if it's meant to be, like, the school sort of personal Facebook or whatever, but they show at times different people have these uh, Facebook-like home pages where they can chat, much like Facebook. Yeah, I couldn't tell whether it was a dating site, though, or, like, a social media site, because it had kind of elements of both. That was one of the things I wanted to mention. He he shut down his website, and for the reason for shutting it down, he says, I am no more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which was awesome. But on that on that profile beforehand, he had as like his quote or whatever, or it was like interests, anything bangable. Yeah. And then it really contradicts right in the next line when it says like likes or something, and he says, no fatty cakes, guts with butts. What does that even mean? <laughs> His personality, that's, I, I think that's the biggest flaw with this movie, is that his personality, you know, I, I think here's the arc we're supposed to get, is that he goes from exterior-focused douchebag to kind of confused, trying to care for Lindy because he feels it's his only chance to get out of this curse to really understanding her as a person and respecting her and enjoying who she is to full blossoming and into adulthood. I didn't feel like we went anywhere close to uh, along that path. What we got was conflictingly (laughs) signed exterior douche. Because that's the other thing. I mean, like, he was mean to Mary-Kate, but... If you want somebody to be, like, the ugly witch in your movie, don't hire one of the, like, prettiest model-slash-businesswomen out there to be your that character, you know what I mean? Like, that just seemed ridiculous. Like, she had her little Borg tattoo around her (laughs) eye, and that was it. But maybe it's like the Neil Patrick Harris thing. You can't you can't actually hire a blind person to play a blind person. You can't actually hire, like, a unattractive witch to play an unattractive witch that's you just can't do that it would just be mean to the unattractive person (laughs) or something and it would just be mean to the blind person to actually cast blind people as blind people yeah yeah that's uh that's that's how it works 
you know, he goes through this whole process where he leaves gifts at her door like a dog, and then it's Juji Fruits that wins her over. Because of her personality, that's why. Right, because she's so goddamn personality. Oh, I fucking hated her character. Oh my god, <laughs> I wanted to kick her in the face repeatedly. It was just like, she's Aww. just so, she's just so like, hey, do you want to go see a thing? There's a window. Yeah, oh, there... <laughs> Okay, but that was, I mean, that was the writing. The the whole thing about the greenhouse. I think the acting played into it as well. Well, yeah, I mean, there was that, like, especially when she was on the phone, like, talking about how miserable she was, and you can tell she's just smiling through the entire conversation. (laughs) Oh, but the rose thing, like, I, that was kind of annoying. Like, it was too heavy handed. They had to have roses in the movie because of the Beauty and the Beast thing. And then they, they have this one greenhouse scene where they have one class in the greenhouse but the class is reading a poem and then they don't even get through the the poem it took him a long time to read that one poem yeah they went through winter and back into spring again (laughs) they must have read like one line a day on that goddamn poem i actually the rose did play into i think my favorite line in the movie which is where when his his girlfriend at the beginning uh doesn't want a rose she wanted an orchid and she what what was her line it was something like thanks for making me look like i don't care asshole and it was just it was like all right it's on the nose and it's over the top but i laughed some of the best worst lines were at the beginning one of them i really liked was kyle is is talking to the the witch character and she says is bullshit one word or two and he replies no it's not (laughs) i also liked how like (laughs) lindy has to say what what was it uh maybe i'm just the scholarship kid throwing up a defensive blah 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 blah. i was just like oh god like my uh, exposition sense just hurt hearing that line mm-hmm. oh and then the when her dad kills the drug dealer guy <laughs> yes. the other drug dealer guy just is also just an awful actor he looks at he looks down he looks at the dead guy he looks at the dude and he's like your daughter for my brother like that's the first thing he says <laughs> when his when his brother dies there there was no way to even know that she was even there but that but that was the contrived uh i, I guess um way that they because then because then hunter steps in and is like oh she can stay at my place even though you've never met me before and you have no idea who i am my favorite for trying to figure out is it the bad is the writing bad or is the acting bad was when they were riffing like i i was kind of shocked by that i was like oh my god they they do riffing in this movie and it should have been funny but instead it's so tortured and overwrought and you could tell that like the director and eventually the editor were like oh jesus christ let's just call it a day this was for the korean like yeah. they were watching the korean tv and and trying to and you couldn't actually tell, like, they both claimed that they spoke Korean, and then and then I couldn't really tell whether they were both lying or just one of them. Yeah, it, w- it was supposed to be, like, this wacky romantic bonding moment where they were both joking, and then they started riffing the, the Korean TV, you know, and then she's, like, mocking him not knowing it. She says, no, that's the subjunctive, which that's possibly my favorite line in the movie. <laughs> But because they neither of them can pull it off and they just have zero chemistry, it really just, I mean, it seemed like they probably got along on set. I felt like that, but I felt nothing more than that beyond that, you know? They, it, yeah, just felt, yeah. it felt like he was at all times just struggling to get the English words out correctly. <laughs> and she was like, oh my god, is there a dinosaur? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that that riffing Korean TV scene was just horrible, and that of course ends with him unveiling himself to her, and, and her response is, "I've seen worse," and I'm wondering where. <laughs> where do you think she's seen? Because I mean, you know, also that's I mean that's not really a nice thing to say. Like at the very end, he brings it up again as proof that she's not like a bad person who only judges based on appearance. But to look at someone and say I've seen worse is is really not that nice of a thing to say <laughs> and and the other thing is they they really shove it down our throats i mean like she's i love that she delivers food to one homeless guy like she doesn't like help out a meals on wheels or something like that she doesn't like bring sandwiches for like a block she just gets one sandwich for one guy yeah i guess we just had to see her being nice to at least one dude so that we know that she is like i don't know is nice or something <laughs> And she goes around New York 
in in obviously not like a horrible but not like a great part of the town just with headphones on and her own little world just la 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 her feelings toward him throughout the entire movie are obviously conflicted and i want to talk about that as a gateway into my other big issue with this film for instance, at one point he sees the picture because uh, she gets elected, what is it, treasurer or whatever, and he's elected class president and they get a picture taken together. It's a very awkward scene where you're meant to think, oh, maybe there's some sort of attraction between them, but she just seems oblivious. And so it's as usual, you know, he's like, hey, as a, you're bangable. And she's like, I love flowers. <laughs> But there, there's a picture taken, and he's, like, staring right at her cleavage, which is amusing. And she's, like, looking off in the distance. And that picture he sees on her desktop later on, and that slides into this story where he's like, oh, you like that guy? And she's like, well, not really, but yes. And it, it just, it's a very confusing scene. My thought was, A... Why the hell is he so shocked that that's her desktop picture when we could see clearly in all the shots that they showed of the faux Facebook page that she used that as her profile picture? Mm. Uh, so that seemed a little silly. And B, it felt to me as if this movie, to me, it, it doesn't feel... This isn't romance, I don't think. There's literally a scene where he takes her and puts her back in bed, and I thought for a moment it might go the route of him being like, well, if I drug her and rape her, I can <laughs> see what she responds to well, so I would know how to please her. Because that's what it had the feeling of. It reminded me a lot of Twilight, because even before they talk, or even before they talk post-curse, he stalks her to see what interests her and see what sees what she's doing, and it's like... Well, right, and the entire thing, like, he... he figures out this way to get her living in his apartment without her ever seeing him or meeting him and then she doesn't even meet him or talk to him until quite a ways into her still living with him and it's just i don't know it's creepy yeah yeah like he totally manipulates the situation into that in the first place and you know it's not really romantic by any means i don't think yeah it's it's creepy it's he's a stalker and i mean i guess we're supposed to feel like he comes to actually love her by the end but i still really felt at the end that it because you know the end is like she's going to machu picchu and he's like you know he finally just instead of just being like how do you feel about me god damn it he finally is just like hey everything's gonna be the same when you get back i'll be here for you and to me it didn't feel as if he had grown up and accepted his fate it felt as if he was giving in to despair yeah me too i definitely got that feeling from it <laughs> For my money, like, I honestly, and I guess I'm just an idiot, but I honestly thought through the entire movie that at the end he would stay the same and that they would just love each other like that and that he would have at that point realized that he didn't need to be pretty to earn her love and uh, that's that's how it would end. And I thought that as, like, a, a bonus, Neil Patrick Harris and uh, Zola would uh, get get their lives made better. But it's weird because... He actually brings that up earlier, and Mary-Kate's like, yeah, I'll help them out if you do your thing. And and we see at the end, we get this quick little epilogue where he's getting his sight back and her kids have green cards so they can come live with her now. And I'm like, you know, she's kind of a bitchy witch. I mean, that's kind of cruel, don't you think? And it's like, how much yes. power does she have, for God's sake? And she, I mean, she uses it very arbitrarily as well. And then at the very end, too, like, the, like the very ending scene is her, now she's going after, she's become the intern for Kyle's father and is presumably going to go curse him as well or something. It made me start to wonder, because I'm pretty sure they're in New York, and it's like, was it getting somebody to realize that true beauty lies on the inside that caused 9-11? <laughs> it, it opens up uh, the possibilities, like, if she has this power... Can I say, at the end, it really bothered me that she, that the love interest didn't get to see him transform back into Kyle. Like, it it introduced a massive amount of confusion, like, right there at the end when they didn't have the time to actually cover exactly what had happened. Because she says, I love you. 
He walks away, transforms back into Kyle, and then she abandons her Machu Picchu trip for no reason and comes back out <laughs> looking for him and finds Kyle and then is like irritated that he's there. And they just, I, I feel like it should have shown the transformation so she wouldn't be confused. I, I think that entire end scene was handled horribly. I think they really had one image they wanted to hold on to. And I agree, I liked the image of her calling the phone of the man she loves and Kyle's phone in his pocket starts ringing and that's what makes her realize and I'm like that's a good image but it doesn't fit here that should be saved for the next rom-com you write because a you know he hasn't talked to her for like a month or something because he's upset because he, he feels that she sees him as a friend and he's hurt by this but it didn't feel like he was hurt because he wanted more it felt like he was like oh man I wasted all this fucking time and now I gotta find some other bitch to say I love you (laughs) Before the next, you know, three weeks are up and these spring yeah. flowers bloom. It did not feel loving at all to me. No, it didn't. And they, like, the, I think the housekeeper tried to say that because the last thing that she says to him, the last thing that Lindy says to Kyle is that, oh, you're a good friend. And then, and then he doesn't call her back for a month. And the housekeeper brings that up for like a second. And then it's just kind of glossed over that he's, oh, he's not actually a good friend. He's just pissed that she isn't in love with him. And she also brings up the best point ever. It's like, what does it hurt to call? So what, you're just a friend, like, be a good friend. And he's like, no, fuck that whore. So, <laughs> but, but the other thing about that end scene is, as you said, she ditches the Machu Picchu trip for no reason. It's like, oh, hey, we're talking again now. Awesome. I, I will talk to you again later. And then she drops, I love you. And it just feels really inappropriate in that public situation where the she's whole, leaving. Yeah, the whole scene was really inappropriate. The whole way he approached it, actually, I, I hated the writing in that scene as well, because he basically, he comes and she basically reiterates again what the whole problem was. And then he goes into this speech of, I was afraid you didn't love me because I'm ugly, but you said that you'd seen worse, so I know that you're not like that, so maybe you do love me. Like, he, it's his entire <laughs> monologue, and she doesn't even get to have a word in edgewise until she gets to walk away and say, I love you. The other thing that I thought was horrible about it, I did like the cell phone ring. I thought that was a good way to show that he's the dude, but you're right, it, she, she should have seen him transform and been like, oh! But I, you know, and then it would have been Vanessa Hudgens playing that and she would have been like, what's that sparkles? <laughs> but the other thing that I absolutely hated is like the last line between them is him making a callback to a mother elephant seeing the bones of her dead children. <laughs> yes, yes, that was a very strange thing to reference. <laughs> It was like, oh, wow, you love me? Could it be a love like a mother who lost her children and sorts through the bones? <laughs> and it was like, oh, wow, how how romantic, I guess. I, that's kind of creepy. But the other thing that I want to know is, you know, Neil Patrick Harris is kind of, he kind of plays the magical Negro in this movie, which is <laughs> odd because um, they didn't cast a real blind person or a real black person for the magical Negro. But he's supposed to be... The kind of, you know, uh, well, I guess Zola is the magical Negro, right? Because they, they both dole out useful advice. They basically, uh, yeah, uh, that. they both basically have the same character for all intents and purposes. But what I wonder is, they obviously both know what happened to him. And Zola has to kind of buy into the whole magic aspect of it, right? Because, I mean, it's like, unless he went out on a wild fucking tattooing spree one that one night, then there's really no other way for this to have happened, right? And so, my question is, are Zola and Neil Patrick Harris just... It's, it's great, I have no idea what his name is. Uh, yeah, Blind, I don't remember. Blindy. Are Zola <laughs> and Blindy just there in case the magic works? I, it really feels like it... Because they aren't really good at, like, uh, taking care of him. Yeah, the tutor is, he, he never actually tutors him. He never actually teaches him anything. And I guess, I mean, she probably does the housekeeping or something, but we never really see it. Blindy is all like, oh, you want to get into her pants? Okay, let's do this, you know? I mean, like, he's just totally okay with faking the fact that he's a good teacher in order to help Kyle get into this chick's pants and reverse the curse. But then he's also sometimes kind of a, a douche to Kyle about it. Like, he was convinced that the green house was like a bad idea and tried to make it seem not cool until 
until Lindy said it was cool, and then he was like, oh, I guess that's all right. Like, so it's hard to tell what side he's on, because he just, I yeah, he was just kind of a strange character. I I think he was hot for Lindy, too. Oh, yeah, it's very possible. I also thought it was a little weird that, except for him approaching Mary-Kate when he comes upon her by accident at the Mardi Gras thing, except for that moment, he never seeks out retribution against her. Like, it seemed like if he were really this shallow, rich, soulless character, the first thing that he would do would be, I don't know, like, hire a hitman or some shit. You know what I mean? Like, for the action that she had taken. And instead, he's just kind of like, oh, well, got cursed. Yeah, but I I'd just chalk that up to bad writing. I you can but you can you could then uh, it, it, it chalk up any sort of weird. I mean, we're trying well, to make they it make they sense. They couldn't have that. They couldn't have that in the plot because they needed all these other things in the plot, like like the blind guy like throwing darts at the wall. How could they fit that in <laughs> if they had this other thing from the plot that made sense? And plus, I mean, they already had to drop this whole huge other element of the story like at the very beginning kyle's relationship with his father is like a big deal and then as soon as he moves into this other house like it's just dropped forever like it's it's not even part of the movie anymore that's because true because they had to fit all these other things in so you know they, they can only tell so many stories at once and they're all <laughs> very important they are one other thing that i'd forgotten about the horrible writing in that end scene the whole the way that it's wrapped up is I don't know if they were going for Star Wars or what, but she says, I love you in this very public space. And, you know, I guess they were going for her declaring her love. And it's a big thing because everybody's looking and kind of aghast at his creepiness and blah, 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 blah. And he just stares at her mutely until she goes. Yeah. He doesn't say, I love you back. and Or he doesn't even say, I know. He just stares at her and then she's finally like, okay, bye. <laughs> And it's the words that he's been wanting to hear for forever because it'll break his curse. You know, you'd think he'd react in some way. Yeah. I kind of buy that she fell for him, but I just, I don't buy that he fell for her. On her side, you know it's love because she deletes texts, important texts from her father in order to talk to him. <laughs> Yeah, which actually she didn't even need to do because she was in the car right next to him. Like, it didn't really, there was no need to delete it, but yeah. <laughs> it was like, because <laughs> the text says, like, that dude who was trying, who, like, the whole reason that you're there, that dude wanting to kill you, he's in jail now. And I'm not, apparently, which is pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> the, somehow that worked out. When are you coming home? And she's just like, Dad, Kyle, Dad, Kyle, delete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like, no, that's really, really irresponsible is what that is. Well, but they're going to a house in the country, which I thought was funny because they were only there for a little while. And then, like, he tells the story about his childhood, about them only being there a little while because they didn't have cell reception. I thought that was an interesting parallel because they they were only there for a few minutes before her dad ODs and they have to leave again. Right, which she finds out from the phone. So apparently cell reception had gotten better since he was a kid, I guess. I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I had totally forgotten about that, but they're like running around and tripping and falling on each other, which seems to happen a lot in romantic comedies. And I'm like, I did that once and I shattered a girl's femur. So <laughs> it's really not as romantic as it looks. <laughs> Be careful of that, Marisha. I, I will try. <laughs> so, Marisha, let's ask this. What one thing would you change to try to make this uh, a a better, more perfect film? I just, I would have included some semblance of a sex scene somewhere. Some sexual tension because they, there wasn't any between the characters. They should have tried to fit it in somewhere else and they didn't. You know, I read a quote once about Showgirls, which I actually really, really like. I actually think Showgirls is an incredible film, and I think people completely misunderstand it. And I can enjoy it for its camp qualities, but I also think that it is incredibly deep, uh, scathing review of American culture. But I read somebody, a review that said it is an example of every single person in front of and behind the camera doing the absolutely most wrong thing at every given moment. <laughs> And I think that's what this movie was for me. And I'm like, to try to unravel one thing, you know, like, I don't necessarily mind having a lead actor who is fairly ESL, but when part of the plot involves him being able to not be recognized, it it, it takes away my uh, suspension of disbelief. 
I don't necessarily mind having Vanessa Hudgens in a role, but when her role requires an insane range of emotion because the writing is so bad and she can't pull that off, it ruins my suspect. You know, it's like absolutely nothing at any given point worked in this movie. Yeah. So, I mean, I seriously don't know because it's like they put Neil Patrick Harris in there. He should save any movie, right? Yeah, well, you know, he might have saved his scenes. Who knows how awful they might have been without him. <laughs> right. We can only if, imagine. If, if you've seen the movie, if you have any feelings, um, also just, you know, fuck romance movies. I just, I fucking hate, it's like it's all this bullshit that we just keep being fed about. This is what it's supposed to be. And it's like, you know, I just, I just want to see two people interacting. You know what I mean? It's like, I want to see two people who have chemistry with each other. And half the time they can't even pull that off. So fuck that noise. I'm not bitter. <laughs> the, but yeah, so if you have any thoughts, feedback, questions, please write to us, info at iceonmars.net. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. Have a good one. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. 